Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Realignments daily series covering the big themes of 2022, moving into the end of the year. Great discussion with Professor Frank Dickender today. We're going to talk about China through the lens of his new book, China After Mao, The Rise of a Superpower. Hope you all enjoy this episode. And once again, if you find any of these particularly confusing, love to get support on Supercast, but also have you share a episode that particularly fits with friends and family. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Frank DeCunner, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having me. Here's a question I am deeply interested in knowing the answer to. You make clear both in China After Mao and then the previous trilogy of books on Mao's rule over China, that your work is very much based upon archives, access that was granted during a very specific period in the history of modern China. Obviously, those archives are now closed. I'm curious, what are questions you would like to have answered if you were a historian 50 years from now, excited to see archives opened up again over the past few years? Oh, that's that's a really good question. First, just to get some of the, the basics out of the way, I think there is a much wider issue here, not just in the history of China, but more generally, um, namely that there is um, a mistake in thinking that secondary sources should be primary and primary sources should be secondary. <laughs> in other words, I think there has been a trend over the last 20, 30 years for historians not to rely all that much on evidence, but on the work of other historians. And clearly, you must find evidence for what you say. Um, and then there is a, a problem very specific to the People's Republic of China. You must understand that the moment the red flag went up over the Forbidden City in China in 1949, um, most foreigners were expelled. Um, the bamboo curtain, so to speak, came down. That country was closed for 30, 40 years, um, all the way up till the 1980s. Then Tiananmen Square 1989 closed again. Uh, here we are. Um, very difficult to get across the border from Hong Kong. So this is a profession that has relied on very weak evidence or evidence from elsewhere, which is why when these archives started opening up some 15 years ago, so around about turn of the millennium, I was in there like a ferret. <laughs> it is fascinating to get hold of so much material uh, when, when normally you would rely on official statements or the People's Daily, the organ of uh, the, the, the Communist Party, or, or evidence which is obviously uh, not very reliable since it comes from an official uh, source. So th this is really as close as you can get to traveling back in time, reading through all this documentation. Of course, some of it is less interesting. Occasionally there are gems, but nonetheless, you get such a good impression of what happened at the time. you got to remember in archives, frequently there will be transcripts of discussions which are not meant to be public. Uh -huh. uh, transcripts of, of, um, of meetings with leaders which are not uh, public. Now, you give me that magic pill, I will wake up some, shall we say, 30 years from now, uh, which might still happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I can roam in the archives. I would look at COVID. What a fascinating story this is. And not just, of course, where it came from, Wuhan or not. That, that really is not the, the, the key point to me. The key point is how and why do you go around locking up so many people so randomly? And of course, the most astonishing aspect of all of this is that it feels as if we are back in the 1960s or 70s. Most journalists were either expelled uh, from, from 2016, 17 onwards, or have left on their own accord. So when you read about the recent um, uh, up, uprisings in Zhengzhou, in the, uh, the Foxconn factory, where workers work for, for, um, for, for Apple, you got to realize you're talking about the political capital of a country which is the size of a of a reasonable European country. We're talking about 99 million people in a country that is roughly between Portugal and Spain in terms of size. There are no reporters there to report what is happening. It's astonishing. So yes, 
would I go back in time and look at this entire period, the last two, three years? Absolutely. And I think it would be fascinating. I think the authorities know far more uh, than meets the eye. And I think there's a lot going on, which is just um, surreal. That's the only term I can give it. This is a hard speculation question to answer. So you can maybe answer it in the context of the previous archive openings. What determines when a authoritarian state even decides to open their archives in the first place? Like what purpose did this opening period that you participated in actually serve? It's a very good question and it's not an easy one. You, you must remember that a one-party state is very much a creation of the 20th century. Uh, we can talk about autocrats, you know, like uh, the, the French kings or, 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 or Greek emperors or so, but they work in a very different context. They work in a context in, in which the people anywhere are seen to be unimportant. Only from 1789 onwards with the French Revolution is there a new political principle that vests sovereignty in the people. Then the question, of course, is who are the people? Who should we include? Women? Probably not. A whole bunch of minorities? Probably not. And then you have an evolving debate. And what happens in the 20th century is that in 1917, Lenin and his Bolshevik friends seize power and claim an absolute monopoly over power. So from that moment onwards, you have a rift, a fracture, a divide that runs through the 20th century. Those who like Lenin and Mussolini in 22 and Adolf Hitler in 33 and Kim Il-sung in 45 and Mao in 49, the list goes on, claim an absolute monopoly of a power to direct the revolution from above. And those like us, who have separation of powers, opposition parties, free speech, checks and balances of civil society. Why is this important? Because you must understand that a one-party state claims to be democratic. This is the key point I wish to make. They too go back to the 1789 French Revolution idea that sovereignty is vested in the people. But they claim that there is a, there is a dictatorship out there in the United States, in the Netherlands, in France, in Japan. As a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, but there's a bourgeois capitalist class that detains all the means of production, hence this revolution which is required from above. In other words, when you speak, if you could, to a Lenin or a Stalin or a Mussolini or a Hitler or a Mao or Xi Jinping, or if you grow up on the Assad in Syria, you will be told our democracy is much better than their democracy. Our judicial system is much better than their judicial system. In other words, these one-party states always thrive to present the illusion of transparency and accountability. It is not for nothing that most of these regimes have either democratic in the name or people in the name, People's Republic of China, uh, Democratic Republic of this and that. Uh, so there's always the claim that they are far more democratic than these than you, uh, your sham democracy in the United States or my sham democracy in England or Switzerland or Holland. Unless you must bear in mind. Hence, there is great pressure um, on the party to at least offer the illusion that there is openness, for instance, in the realm of information, including, of course, an access to archives, which generally in most democracies um, is granted after a period of time, which tends to be 30 years. So mm -hmm. I think what happened in China in the 1997, in the 1990s, sorry, is that a bunch of historians began to protest by saying, look, we can study the history of our own country by going to Moscow after the fall of the Soviet Union, 91, 92. We have to go all the way to Moscow to study the country of our own country. Why can we not read our own country, our own files here in Beijing? And I think that put pressure on um, the state. Now, there's another issue you got to realize. It isn't just historians who use the archives. In fact, they are a minority. There's people walk in there, ordinary people from all walks of life, and they want to know what happened to their house. They've lost an uncle. Uh, they must have a copy of, of some deed or a certificate. Uh, 
uh, or information about when a family member left a factory or retired or, or proof that they actually lived around that area. So, so that's, that's another reason. But of course, extraordinary, and um, I know have been going on for some time, but let me add one key point. I just mentioned the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1992. Um, I did Russian history. I have worked in the archives in, in Moscow, and I'm, I was all along all too well aware of the fact that in Russia, the archives opened up in the early 90s, but then later on were closed down by Putin. So there was a golden opportunity there, a window of opportunity. And I realized that the same might happen to the People Republic of China. So again, I was in there like a ferret. I did the very best. I was traveling up and down that country. Literally, as COVID was spreading, I was on planes flying up and down, including to Wuhan, in October, November, December 2019. And that was, of course, the end of it. So here's a question then to go back to this. The book is called, you know, China after Mao. We're going to focus on the, the the Maoist period, especially right here. How did then the United States, how did the West then interpret what the PRC was doing during this period where the country was shut down? Like how was the post, let's say, uh, Korean War period understood then? Well, very poorly. And since you ask me very specifically about the United States as opposed to, say, Britain or, or, or Europe, let, let me tell you that there were two issues here, one which was specifically American. Uh, the first issue is, of course, no access to information. So Hong Kong, where I live right now, became this sort of, um, this sort of Berlin of the East, where you would come and then try to get hold of newspapers from across the border, mainland China, or documentation, or interview people who might have, you know, swam across to Hong Kong or, or somehow managed to find their way into this place. You got to remember Hong Kong until 97 was a crown colony, belonged to, uh, to the Queen. So Hong Kong was an observation post to find out more, but you can imagine very difficult. Um, so you would also, of course, read uh, cables from diplomats based in maybe Shanghai or Beijing, but very little information. Now, it becomes much more complicated during the Cultural Revolution, where, of course, whoever had not been expelled from the POC yet uh, got in trouble as a foreigner. But it's compounded by another issue which is very American, namely that from the very beginning, from 1949 onwards, a great number of China specialists were quite sympathetic to Mao and the Communist Party of China. Uh, take, for instance, the man who's called the doyen of Chinese studies, the dean in America of Chinese studies at Harvard, John King Fairbank, who wrote, for instance, edited the Cambridge history of modern China. Uh, he was the key figure when it came to the history of modern China, including the entire Maoist era. It was rather sympathetic. Now, here is the problem. John King Fabing and others went out of their way to expel from the field uh, scholars who were critical of what was happening uh, after 1949. And quick uh, question. Yes. Where did the sympathy originate from? Was it Chinese specifically? Was it communist Marxism? Like, where, why were they sympathetic? That's not a quick question. I'll <laughs> come back to it in a moment. That's a very good question, but it's not a quick one. So yeah, I'll no keep, worries. <laughs> I'll keep it for, for, for in a minute. So if you take, for instance, a book by a wonderful man called uh, Richard Walker, Dixie Walker, he came to Hong Kong. He interviewed uh, refugees from the mainland. He read everything he could and published a book on the first years of the People's Republic of China, published in 1955. He was literally hounded out of the field, had a very successful career, by the way, became ambassador in South Korea. But you, you, you can tell that if you are critical 
of the crimes against humanity, of the cultural revolution, uh, of the tens of millions of people who, who were uh, worked, beaten, starved to death at the height of the Great Leap Forward, the famine from 1958 to 62. If you actually wrote about it, you could not have a career in the United States of America. Uh, in fact, um, that uh, situation is different today, but not all that different. So that's a very specific American issue. So the question then is, why were they so sympathetic? Well, it goes beyond the world of academia. Um, the Americans, one wouldn't want to generalize when speaking you know, to, to an American, but there's something of a missionary spirit in that. And Americans have made a very common mistake when it comes to China. They've made it time and again. I'll give you three examples. That mistake, which is widespread, by the way, it's not confined to the United States of America. It's very, very common. It, 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 it has to do with the nature of Chinese communism. That's really a simple choice. You either believe that Chinese communism is not really communism. It's the extension of a tradition, a civilization, a tradition, a, 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 a culture. It's like a tradition, something Chinese about it. Or, or on the other hand, which tends to be the minority of people, you understand that Chinese communism is communism. And it comes from 1917, Lenin, the Bolsheviks, and the Leninist principle of a monopoly over power, not to mention the Marxist principle of um, a um, of state control over the means of production. Uh, so the idea that Chinese communists are not really communists runs throughout the United States. It's a mistake made by the State Department before 1949, during the civil war between the communists and the nationalists. The nationalists had helped the United States during the Second World War. They were an ally. Chiang Kai-shek, head of the nationalists, was one of the four powers during the Second World War. We tend to forget that. Um, we tend to think of, you know, Soviet Union, uh, Great Britain, United States, but China was one of the four great powers. Well, the State Department described Mao Zedong and his guerrilla, his army of guerrilla fighters, as sort of agrarian reformers who somehow would be quite democratic in future. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two comes in 1972. Nixon, Kissinger go to Beijing, a rapprochement with China between China and the United States. Henry Kissinger describes China at the time as some sort of Confucian tradition, which has absolutely nothing to do with Lenin or Stalin, never mind Karl Marx, the, the German with the big beard. It is as if somehow these people come straight from a culture that goes back several millennia, nothing to do with communism. That's, of course, a mistake. And then 92, uh, 94, Bill Clinton, in the wake of the massacre on Tiananmen Square, um, is one of many to suggest that if you help the People's Republic of China carry out their economic reforms, then somehow, quite naturally, there will be political reforms. So with economic growth, what you will see is a China that will become democratic. It's, it's unavoidable. Um, so that, I think, is the mistake that runs very deeply throughout the United States, uh, even before the 40s, pretty much till a year or two or three ago. Let me add one thing. Uh, nobody in the People's Republic of China has ever said that the People's Republic of China would become a democracy, that there would be a separation of powers, that there would be opposition parties. And nobody's ever said that. <laughs> Every leader from Mao onwards till the last one has made it crystal clear that China will never have the separation of powers, will never have uh, an open ballot and open uh, opposition parties. It, it's, it's just that foreigners simply don't want to listen. They don't hear it. They don't want to hear it. Two questions then. One, I recall though there being some sort of pamphlet that Mao released before power that spoke of democracy. Am I confusing the history there? No, you're not. Um, Mao has a ghostwriter who helps him come up with a pamphlet entitled On 
the new democracy. This was published in 1942. You got to remember during the Second World War, China is invaded by Japan. Mao, after a very long march in uh, the middle of the 1930s, uh, arrives in the hinterlands in, in, in Yen and Shanxi province, a, a very remote region, inaccessible for both the nationalists, but also for the Japanese. It becomes his sort of fortress uh, where he takes refuge during the Second World War. Um, this is a very small place in the middle of nowhere. 1942, it attracts a lot of uh, attention uh, because Mao publishes on the new democracy. He does promise, very much like Lenin, by the way, he promises everything that people <clears throat> would like to hear um, on the, the new democracy, promises democracy, uh, po promises elections, promises um, everything to every group that matters, land for the villagers, protection of private property, for businessmen, better working conditions for the workers, independence for ethnic minorities. Uh, in effect, he does the same thing as the Bolsheviks did before 1917, which is to make a lot of promises. You will then break one by one once you are in a position of power. This is very much what happens after 1949. So the key point then is that what you are stating is that once the actual Chinese Communist Party is in charge of the country, there is yes. no promise of democracy. We're when we're speaking of nineteen forty two. We're speaking at a moment where, as I understand it, you know, you would not have ex no one no one in the West would assume that the nationalists would actually lose to the agrarian reforming guerrillas. I'd assume. Yeah. Yes. Although, although again, because it might sound as if any reasonable person who would read this tract by Mao, published nineteen forty two, should believe that they are. Uh, Democrats, all the evidence at the time is that this is merely a propaganda tract. There's very little evidence that there's a real genuine interest in democracy on the part of the Communist Party. This is a party which very openly uh, advertises the benefits of uh, a monopoly of the power, which invokes uh, Lenin and Stalin, which is funded to a great extent by the Soviet, entirely by the Soviet uh, Union, is supported militarily by the Soviet Union after 1945. Uh, the Soviet Union hands over uh, large chunks of Manchuria, which they have invaded on their way uh, to Korea, and eventually uh, the idea is that you know they, they will meet up at the 38th parallel in Korea with the Americans, which they do. In, in September 45, they hand over Manchuria to Mao. They help him uh, arm his guerrilla fighters. Um, some of the very best officers from uh, the from 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 Mao's guerrilla army are sent to Moscow for advanced training. Not to mention all the tracks about Marxism and land reform and confiscation of land and all other means of production. So it's crystal clear to anyone observer. Um, that this is a very thoroughly Marxist Leninist party. So the track published in 1942 really must be seen in that context as a sort of an outlier, as a sort of you know propaganda piece, which um, you may or may not believe. And another question that comes to mind: We're talking about democracy. I, I noticed um, on a podcast you recently did around this book, the advantage of recording a little after the release. You, you mentioned that when the word democracy is actually used in a Chinese context, oftentimes Chinese leaders today who were persecuted during the Cultural Revolution, they will actually not associate the excesses of the Cultural Revolution with authoritarianism or communism gone wrong, but they'll say that's what democracy was. So can you explain what you mean by that? Because I think it really speaks to Wait, Xi Jinping's family was persecuted during the during the Cultural Revolution. Why would they still be so pro-Marxist and pro all this sort of system? This gets at the nuance there, I think. This is a really good question. I get this question all the time. Why is it that Deng Xiaoping, or why is it that Chiang Zemin, or why is it that Xi Jinping are not more in favor of democracy since they were victims of the Cultural Revolution? Well, if you understand what the Cultural Revolution is, it, it, should, it shouldn't surprise you. So the, the question is, what was the Cultural Revolution? Well, in a nutshell, Mao launches a great leap forwards 
in which people on the countryside, hundreds of millions of people, are herded into giant collectives. These collectives are called people's communes. It's a form of radical collectivization. Uh, the idea is that if, if, if every man, every woman in the countryside becomes a, a foot soldier and a giant army, this is all organized uh, like an army. People's communes are, are, are literally militarized uh, places with barracks and dormitories and kinder, kindergartens for children. Um, if, if every man, every woman becomes a foot soldier in this giant army, you can transform the economy overnight by having them work. Well, of course, many are worked to death and many starve. The whole thing goes pear-shaped. By 1962, there are tens of millions of people who have just vanished from the countryside. They are dead. Mao's star, his standing among his colleagues, uh, is, is now at its lowest. So Star uh, Mao wonders whether he will undergo the same fate as Stalin. Remember, Stalin, head of the Soviet Union, died in 1953. Three years later, he is denounced by Nikita Khrushchev, um, who pretty much starts a process of de-Stalinization, accuses Stalin of having committed crimes against humanity, uh, of having presided over a cult of personality, pretty much drags his body out of the mausoleum. So Mao wonders, will this happen to me, possibly even before I die? Now, Mao is... As a smart man, he realizes Stalin never spotted Nikita Khrushchev. Stalin never suspected that Khrushchev might do that to him. So the issue is, how can you spot the people who will bring you down? You can't. The solution is the Cultural Revolution. The, the ideology behind it is quite straightforward. Communist ideology is under threat. Good proletarian culture is under threat from bourgeois capitalist ideas. And these, this bourgeois capitalist culture must be eradicated. That's the Cultural Revolution. Um, but underneath, there's another idea that Mao allows ordinary people to denounce every member of the Communist Party, whether it's a local cadre who runs a factory, or whether it's a powerful minister all the way up in Beijing. That is really the cultural revolution. At first, students who become Red Guards are allowed to scrutinize their teachers and denounce those who might harbor uh, bourgeois capitalist thoughts, you know, teachers who might have secretly criticized Chairman Mao at the height of the Great Leap Forward. But, but then in the autumn of 1966, the Red Guards come out in August 66, in the autumn of 66, ordinary people at every level are allowed to put up big posters and denounce anyone in a position of power. So he has powerful figures. Number two, Liu Shaoqi arrested. Deng Xiaoping purged several times. Zhou Enlai put under pressure. Liu Shaoqi will, will, will die in prison of uh, neglect. There is hardly a member of the Communist Party who is left standing. At some point or another, every single one of them is publicly humiliated, scrutinized, um, occasionally you know, beaten, possibly even imprisoned or sent off to a camp. So when Mao dies in 1976, the leaders are determined never, ever, to allow ordinary people to criticize the Communist Party again. And as this happens from 66 to 68 is the key phase of the Cultural Revolution. It doesn't stop then, but that's the key phase. From 66 to 68, of course, other leaders of Communist parties, Kim Il-sung in North Korea, uh, Khrushchev, sorry, it's not Khrushchev, it's uh, another one, I think, Brezhnev, if I'm not wrong. But they all look at this and in sheer amusement, why would one do that? So Mao is the only one person, the only one leader of one party state who allowed ordinary people to take to task the instrument that propelled them to power, which is the party itself. In other words, in the eyes of the leaders, but also their sons and daughters, members mm -hmm. of the red aristocracy, members of the Communist Party, like Xi Jinping, they are repelled by what they see. 
And they think you, you really shouldn't allow ordinary people to ever voice any criticism. You should never allow them to occupy uh, the stage. You must crush their political aspirations. And that is precisely what happens afterwards. What's interesting is that when you frame people-centric opposition and criticism to of the CCP, you frame it around specifically the critique of people trading power for money, corruption, that being corruption, obviously. But you can have a society that isn't corrupt, that is also not democratic. There can be separations of power, right? You've, you've put out in another interview that despite what you, all of the horrible things I, one would rightfully say about Putin's Russia, there is technically a separation of power. So I guess the real question would be is, why is there this persistent theme of corruption throughout post-1949 Chinese history? It seems like this would be an issue that you could solve within the system that they've created. Yes. Um, first of all, there's corruption everywhere. Uh, you go to Wall Street, pr plenty of corruption over that. Yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> but I do insist, I'll come back to that in a minute, I do insist that, um, as Churchill pointed out, um, democracy or the separation of powers is an awful system except for all the others. <laughs> in other words, if you do have a monopoly over power, if you are in a one-party state, um, then you're not going to have journalists who will track down the merest whiff of corruption and write about it. You will not have an independent judicial system that will uphold your rights to look um, at your competitor, let's say, uh, you know, who, who might be um, running an enterprise um, uh, which goes against the law. Um, you will not, in a separation of powers, you, you do not have to, to curry political favor. It might be wise to do so, but you don't have to. In other words, without a free pass, press, without checks and balances, um, without opposition parties where people get voted in and out, it's very difficult to bring that corruption to light. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. In a one-party state, power is in the hands of party members. If you're not a party member, you don't have much power. In other words, this is the constant theme of opponents uh, in the People's Republic. They say so already before um, the so the so-called era of reform and opening up, already at the democracy war in 1979, the post is going up about the separation of powers. They say so in 1989 on Tiananmen Square, Liu Xiaobo and others come back time and again to stress the same message, namely that people trade power for money. That's the, 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 this is the key issue. Now, I understand what you're trying to say. There are countries where there is some form of separation of power, but I have to say it's, it's pretty rare. Um, let, let me stress again, there's corruption everywhere. <laughs> And we see it all the time, uh, and, and, and not just about money, but abuse of power. Um, th th this is what keeps journalists and historians so busy when it comes to the United States and Europe and Japan and all these democracies. is right about all this human awfulness at, at, at every level, and not just in the past, but to this very day. But that's part of the exercise of the separation of powers, that you do have people who can scrutinize all of this and eventually bring it to light, even if it takes far too long. So, the, But the key point you made is that there are systems where it, there might be some separation of powers, as in the case of Russia under Putin. And I have to say, I agree in, in part. I think, in fact, uh, very few countries where you have a, a sort of wishy-washy separation of powers. You either have it or you don't. I think mm. it's reasonably clear-cut. Um, but it is true that after 91, 92, collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia did begin having uh, a constitution. It is true that on the Duma and Moscow until recently, you could find... Um, figures of the opposition. It is true um, that Putin has journalists killed 
which you wouldn't see under Stalin, of course, under Mao, because every journalist is a state employee and writes what they are supposed to write. So there's no need for you to go after a journalist and, and, and dispose of them, so to speak. So there, there are, if you wish, um, th- th- there's a, a, a weak separation of powers, the structure which is there. It's the same, by the way, uh, for Erdogan in Turkey, where the head of the opposition was actually elected as mayor uh, of, of the capital. Can you imagine that, Istanbul? Can you imagine there being an opposition party in North Korea or in the People's Republic of China, and that person being elected to run Pyongyang or Beijing is unimaginable. So quite clearly, Russia, Turkey, uh, and a number of other countries are in a separate uh, case. And I think they are countries that have separation of power, except that separation of powers is so much weaker than it is uh, in comparison to, say, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the United States, Canada, other countries. It takes a long time to build this up. You may have it on paper. You may have the structures which are in place. It just takes a very long time uh, to build this up. And of course, the building is never finished, even if you have a reasonably free press and a reasonably independent judicial system, unlike, of course, Russia or Turkey, never mind one-party states, then you must constantly address new challenges. A a new medium appears, like the internet. What is private? What is not? Uh, We had these debates when the post office appeared, well over a century ago. When you write a letter, and the letter is posted, it's no longer in your home. And it's not in the home of the person you send it to. So while it is en route, while, while it's being handled by the post office, is it still private or not? All sorts of debates about these issues. They're not new. Well, this is, I think, the key point about separation of powers and checks and balances, that you can constantly fine-tune and address new issues. So it looks on the outside quite messy. And there will always be lots of corruption. People who take opportunities which are new, uh, which, which, which they shouldn't. And, you know, at some point will be hopefully brought to, to, to justice. The, the, the key point, I think, is always the same. It goes back to Churchill. It's not a perfect system, but it's better than all the others. In the case of Russia and Turkey, um, they are, if you, if you wish, fragments of separation of powers which haven't had time to be, to be built up. So the corruption in the case of Russia is so incredibly widespread uh, because, again, the national assets after the collapse of the Soviet Union were pretty much distributed to a bunch of oligarchs uh, through Putin, who is, of course, the, the biggest oligarch and the head. Himself, himself. So in that sense, it's not entirely dissimilar from the People's Republic of China, where, of course, party members are in control of all the key assets. But it, it is nonetheless quite different in that there was something in the, the early 1990s uh, that was moving towards you know, on paper, it is a constitution. There are opposition parties. That there are uh, elections, but they're rigged. So the question really is, when it comes to Putin, um, is he is he forced to live with this very weak structure that points to separation of powers? Is he incapable of getting rid of it? Is he willing to live with it? Is he incapable of getting rid of it? I would say over the years, he's undermined it very, very thoroughly. And we're not all that far away from a one-party state, but it's still not a one-party state. And I think that points fundamentally at two things. One is the relative weakness of Putin versus a Xi Jinping or you know, any North Korean dictator. And also the the relative strength of what I described as a very weak separation of powers. It may be weak, but it's still there. It's not so easy to get rid of it. A question that comes to mind would be, I want to be very precise about this because you also stated this in a podcast, so I didn't quite get down your answer, but you pointed out when one is thinking about how many in the West and the United States especially have misconceived China. You said at the root of this misconception is this deep focus on cultural touch points. I think your your quote was about like talk of chopsticks when you don't do the equivalent. 
um, in, in, in Russia. And what I'm wondering about here too, I worked at PBS before, um, I did this podcast and I would, oftentimes there'd be these huge sets of cliches. I know you've heard of, you know, the, you know, unlike in the West, unlike in the United States, the, the Chinese plan long-term and they're not short-sighted when going over this history from 49 to 2012, where the latest book ends, there are numerous cases of very poor planning. So I, I'm, I'm curious, like, where you think these just, it seems to be empirically like, so not just like Orientalist in the sense of like, that's like not great academic history, but also just like not even empirically correct. Like, what is the root of this need to make these big cultural sweeping statements about like the Chinese specifically? Um, well, you said it's Orientalist or racist. Um, I hate to use the term, but that, that's exactly what it is we we assume that we know so much about these people will do this that that and that it's a good story by the way this notion that the chinese quote unquote are so much better at long-term planning there's an anecdote um when um i think it's um again kissinger who speaks to chairman mao when he visits in uh, 72 and he asks him um you know what do you think of um the french revolution you know, 1789, I mentioned it earlier on. So Joe and Lai says, well, you know, it's just too early to tell. So for Henry Kissinger, this really encapsulates that Chinese sense of time. The French Revolution happened in 1789. In 1972, Joe and Lai is still not quite ready to offer an opinion. <laughs> not a, nothing about Napoleon, nothing about the concept of Europe. No. Still, we're still waiting. But of course, <laughs> You know, here's the punchline. Joe and I is not talking about 1789. He's talking about the student protests in Paris in 1968, a few years earlier. So this is the level of miscomprehension. Joe and I thinks student protests in Paris, 68. Kissinger thinks French Revolution, 1789. This is the clash, a clash of worldviews, right? As I say in China after Mao, those leaders spent 10 years watching each other's backs during the Cultural Revolution. By the time they come out of it, when the chairman dies in 1976, most of them are unable to place a medium-sized country on a map. That's where they are, very ignorant about the rest of the world. Now, back to your question. Why is it that we assume that they're always so different? I call it the double standard. Uh, it's always the same story. You can talk about anything and everything and anyone on planet Earth. It doesn't matter whether it is about Zimbabwe or Sudan or North Korea, South Korea, Japan. The list goes on. It's all nice and well. The moment you say China, the answer is, ah, but in China, things are different. So it's the so-called China difference. So nothing appears to apply. The question is, where does that come from? I think a profound need on the part of a great number of, shall we call them, Westerners, people who live in Europe, Australia, United States, profound need to believe that there is something elsewhere. There's a, there's a place on planet Earth where things are done differently. If you don't like the world as it is, if you don't like modernity, if you, if you think it's uh, a capitalist world and it's bad, or a neoliberal order and it's bad, I don't use these terms. Um, I think these are democracies and they're messy places. It's very hard work. You know, being married is hard work. <laughs> Having a family is hard work. Running a small enterprise is hard work. Running a department is, is hard work. Everything involving human beings is just hard work, and it's messy. There are no clear answers to a great number of issues. Now, the point really is, if you are not, if you're discontent of modernity, you believe there's something profoundly wrong with the world as it is, then your hope is that there's a place somewhere where things are done differently. Now, that place is not going to be in Africa for the same racist reasons. Uh, and it's not going to be a small country in Asia. It's going to be big. So China fulfills that role. China, thousands of years of civilization, 
exotic orientalist seems so very different. Well, of course it's not. Of course it's not just human beings like you and me. They may be different, the differences of, of degree, not of kind. Now you try living in a one party state, you would behave differently too. So I think that's really the core of the issue. It's the need for so many of us to think that there is something quite different, different civilization, a different realm altogether out there that might offer hope if that is what you need. So for the last two or three questions, I, I recall a line in China After Mao where you talk about the, the opening up um, to the United States specifically and how it was actually premised in contrast to the way we tell the story, on the idea that actually the United States was in terminal decline. Therefore, if you are China, we're in the middle of the Sino-Soviet split, it's best to actually ally with the United States and Japan to counterbalance against a rising Soviet Union. So that kind of brings to mind, so I'd love for you to explain the history there real quick, but also it also brings to mind a question of um, just the, 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 the Chinese ability not to <laughs> get orientalist though. We just sort of <laughs> to, 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 to the Chinese ability to evaluate the United States in general, because it's kind of funny for, if, if we're thinking about Putin going to the earlier part of the conversation, a huge part apparently of Putin's calculus regarding the war in Ukraine was maybe the United States, maybe NATO, maybe the West won't actually stand up, maybe they're paper tigers. So the ability to calculate whether countries are on the decline or on the up and up seems to be deeply important. I'm interested in how countries get to that answer. Yes, of course, countries don't, except in democracies. It's leaderships. And leadership in a one-party state means the leader. So we'll get back, back to that in a moment. How do leaders assess their opponents or presumed opponents? But first, this big geopolitical myth on the side of the People's Republic of China, namely that capitalism will eventually uh, collapse. It goes back, of course, to Uncle Karl Marx, the man with the beard, the funny German, who uh, in a nutshell has been predicting the imminent collapse of capitalism for well over a century. So if you're a Marxist, whether you're Lenin or, or whether you're Kim Il-sung or whether you're Mao, um, you believe this, that there are, there are contradictions built within the capitalist system, which will eventually lead to its downfall. The whole point about Lenin and the revolution is that um, in classic Marxism, all you need to do is really wait. These contradictions are such that capitalism will collapse under its own weight and there will be a proletarian uh, revolution. But of course, Lenin is not all that eager to just sit back and wait. So he wants to make that revolution happen from above. This is why he seized his power in 1917, saying with Mao, 1949, let's make the revolution. Let's not just wait for it to happen. So these people have been bred up uh, thinking about the imminent collapse of capitalism. And they believe it is happening all the time. Whenever there's a crisis, Whenever there's inflation, whenever there's unemployment, whenever a bank collapses, anywhere uh, in a democracy, they believe that this is a sign that the capitalist camp is about to in implode. Um, now, when the Americans um, withdraw gradually from Vietnam at the end of Mao's life, Deng Xiaoping and others see this, again, as a sign of weakness. I believe, ah, the Americans are withdrawn from Vietnam. They're leaving Asia, which means that the Soviets will have much greater clout, which is not an unreasonable assumption to make. Uh, but where they go wrong is that they believe that the Soviet Union is going to be the winner in the Cold War. The Americans are under decline, witnessed their withdrawal from Vietnam. So the big enemy is the Soviet Union, so you must make an alliance with the weaker powers, which are Japan and the United States, before they decline terminally, so to speak. So if you create an alliance with them, then you can surround the Soviet Union, and there is some hope that you might survive. Now, of course, 
doesn't go like that at all. 1991 Soviet Union uh, implodes. It's a fortress um, which appears to be empty. Shock and horror in, in Beijing. Uh, not only that, but America and Japan, those weaker powers in decline, turned out to be actually quite powerful. <laughs> so, so this is a major geopolitical, uh, if you wish, misunderstanding on the part of the leadership in Beijing. And of course, it doesn't just disappear in the 1980s and 90s, quite the opposite. The moment the Lehman Brothers Bank collapses in New York in 2008, there is a conviction in Beijing that this is the moment where the world crisis will consume capitalism. This is the moment, 2008, where capitalism will finally collapse and socialism will prevail. So this is the moment where hubris uh, becomes widespread among the leadership. Hubris, the idea that socialism is superior, their system will prevail, the imperialist camp is about to disappear into the dustbin of history. Deep, profound conviction. So this notion of, a, of an inevitable decline of capitalism is very much in the DNA uh, of communist parties. It, it, it's in their ideology. Now, you might say Putin is not a committed Marxist, but surely he grew up uh, with, with that background. He grew up uh, in the Soviet Union. He went quite high up. That's also part of his worldview. But the key point here really is that dictators, whether they are Marxists or not, and Mussolini started off as a Marxist and became a fascist, uh, Hitler is not a Marxist, but Nazis, National Socialism, there are socialist elements in, in there. It's always about the people, except, of course, uh, a fascist like Mussolini uh, or a Nazi like Hitler will not emphasize class struggle, but national unity. It's all about national unity. But all these dictators on the left, on the right, if you wish, um, surround themselves by sycophants, and it's inevitable. And the reason for this is quite clear. If you seize power, as Lenin did, or Mussolini, or Hitler, or if you obtain power through a revolution, you will live in fear that someone else will do it to you. If you are voted in, you realize that after a number of years, you might be voted out. You know who your opponent is. Your opponent makes it pretty clear. <laughs> That's a democratic system. But once you are a dictator, you don't quite know who your opponent might be. You don't know who could possibly stab you in the back or organize a coup or use the army to get rid of you. It happens all the time. So it becomes a fear. So you want to make sure that the people who are, who are around you are loyal to you. Loyalty becomes paramount. But the issue is how do you know who's really loyal? Because they're all lying to you. They might be lying. <laughs> So this is the dictator's conundrum, that you want people who are loyal, but you never truly know wh whether they are loyal. So in the end, what you have is sycophants. This happens with Putin. It happens to this day. People tell him, your war is great. You will win. You will prevail. Um, the West is on the decline. You get false information. Nobody wants to stand up and say, look, you've got this completely wrong. Uh, you've made a mistake. It's not going to happen. In other words, leaders in one-party states tend to take off and become prisoners of their own worldview, where nobody challenges what they say and what they think. They never hear a no. And then the grasp on reality becomes rather tenuous, like Adolf Hitler trying to direct the war <laughs> from Berlin. Uh, after Stalingrad, you know, against his very best generals. They start interfering in every, as every, every aspect. They want to control everything. It goes very much pear-shaped. So I think in the case of Putin, it's quite clear. 2014, you cannot only blame him. It takes Crimea. Um, 
Democracies do very little about it, so it can only be encouraged to do more. Then he miscalculates massively. I think this is one of the key issues with one-party states, massive inability to properly assess um, others. In the case of the PRC, just imagine, most ordinary Americans <laughs> have not spent any time living in a foreign country. They, they can go on a holiday. But if they were to spend one year in Brussels or in Geneva or in London, they would probably realize that people that think and do things very differently, it takes time to understand what difference means. When you live in a very large country like the United States or like China or like Russia, you tend to think of others as a mere continuation of yourself. If you grow up in a very small country like the Netherlands, while well, you cross the border, and people speak funny and you realize they don't speak like you. <laughs> they don't even share uh, the same sense of same words. You know, the language can divide deeply. But the point I'm trying to make is that in the People's Republic of China, not only is it quite difficult, as it is for Americans, to truly understand the nature of difference elsewhere, but the leadership itself is imprisoned both by an ideology, Marxism, Leninism, but also by a system that tends to reduce opinions which might challenge the, their worldview. In other words, they are trapped, they're trapped very proudly. So I think the danger here is um, on the part of Americans and others, the danger is that we misunderstand the extent to which the leadership in Beijing really, truly believes in Leninism, Marxism, and that the whole worldview uh, which is very in, 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 inimicable uh, towards democracy or what they call the imperialist camp. We tend to underestimate that. We tend to think they only say that because they think they must. This goes back to what I said in the beginning. It goes back to the, the, the idea that Chinese communism isn't really communism, but it, it really is communism. They really are communists. They really are convinced that their system, their ideology, will in the end work much better than this wishy-washy sham democracy that you and I have. So massive misunderstanding of the United States on the part of the leadership in Beijing. And I would say for a great many decades, pretty serious misunderstanding on the part of the leadership, not just in Washington, but elsewhere of China. In fact, if you will allow me to take another three minutes, Please. I, know I, I can go on for quite some time, but it's just occurred to me recently that one of the key notions that matters here, and one which is emphasized by the leadership in Beijing time and again, is the notion of peaceful evolution, peaceful evolution. Jiang Zemin identified peaceful evolution as the threat number one in the summer of 1989, uh, after Tiananmen Square. Uh, and continue to do so. Xi Jinping has taken it on board as well. So what is peaceful evolution? It is a notion developed by John Foster Dulles, D-U-L-L-E-S, not the airport, that's his brother, in 1957. The idea was that you should help the World Bank, international institutions, the United States, should help satellite states of the Soviet Union like Poland and Hungary economically, so that when they develop economically, they will undergo a peaceful evolution towards democracy. And this is exactly what happens on the 4th of June, 1989, when in Poland, uh, the Communist Party has mistakenly allowed people to vote, and the people vote the Communist Party out of power for the first time in a country under a red flag. Same thing happens in Hungary. In other words, a great number of these satellite states in 1989 evolve peacefully towards the market, vote themselves out of communism into democracy. So this creates shock and horror in Beijing. And they understand very well what's happening. And from there onwards, 
they identify peaceful evolution as a great threat. Any attempt to meddle with any aspect of the Marxist-Leninist system could be seen as peaceful evolution. If you as an American or me as a Dutch person, if I want to contribute to a civil society in China or help a private enterprise or show a movie, or anything, all things foreign are part of a plot at peaceful evolution. So when people like Bill Clinton and later on George Bush or Kevin Rudd in Australia um, or Tony Blair in the UK talks about how China will evolve peacefully into a democracy, if only we help them economically with the economic reform, when they say that in the wake of economic reform, inevitably there will be political reform, this is all the evidence the leadership in Beijing needs to believe that there truly is a plot of peaceful evolution at hand. Those foreign leaders wish to infiltrate and subvert power leading to the overthrow of the Communist Party of China. That's exactly what they think. So talking about two, <laughs> two people speaking at cross purposes, that's what we have from, from 1989 onwards. So it's unbelievable, unbelievable. So the here's, the, here's the question I'll wrap with. The, the book ends in 2012. Like Once again, the key thing here is this is archival. You're, you're not doing contemporary analysis. But I'm curious, do you think if someone picked up this book, let's say, let's say you go back in time, reversing the opening question, and you give this book to someone in 2012, would it shock them that Western China, Chinese relations are as low as they are today. Could you look at the world from a Chinese perspective in 2012 with as much information as your book has and not be shocked at a potential Taiwan crisis, Hong Kong, zero COVID, bipartisan turn against China and the United States? How do you think about that? Well, I think it's inevitable. It, it, it was there all along, now, all along the leadership made it clear that they would stick to the leadership of the party. You have to go back to 1982, when Deng Xiaoping has the four cardinal principles enshrined in the constitution. So what are the four cardinal principles? Uphold the leadership of the party, uphold the socialist way, uphold Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, uphold the dictatorship of the proletariat. You may scoff and think, uh, these are very old-fashioned terms, it's Cold War rhetoric. This goes back to 1982. But every single leader has emphasized the four cardinal principles every time when there was an important occasion. Last time I heard someone emphasize the four cardinal principles was by Xi Jinping in October 22 at the 20th Party Congress. So this is the DNA. This is the foundation of the regime. And that's what I pointed out in my book. So had you read the book in 2012, you know, had it been published 10 years earlier, um, it would have been just as truthful. But I think you might have been less surprised at what happened under Xi Jinping. And the key point of the book is to show you that this was in the making all along. There hasn't been some strange reversal after 2012 with Xi Jinping. Kevin Rudd recently published a piece telling us Red China is back. Well, my point is Red China never went away. Kevin Rudd just fell asleep. The, the point is that all along, this was quite clear. It was our problem, not listening. It wasn't their problem telling us what it is they wanted and where they were going. So Xi Jinping, in other words, has tightened up the screws, but they were tightening up the screws all along, in particular after 1989. They didn't always have the clout to do so. It goes back to the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution is a massive undermining of the organization of the Communist Party of China. It will take decades to rebuild it. 
And Johnson Young in the 1980s makes it worse with decentralization by allowing local governments to have a much greater say in the economy. It works a little bit for the economy, but it creates all sorts of tensions between center and local power. The point I'm trying to make is it takes a lot of time to rebuild the clouds of the Communist Party of China. Chiang Zemin was tightening up the screws. Hu Jintao was tightening up the screws. Xi Jinping merely is a continuation of what we've seen since 1989. And it's not, again, a difference of uh, kind. It's a difference of degree. That is a great place to to leave it. I'd love you to shout out um, all of your books because I think of I think of this. What I guess there are five books we've mentioned um, today. People should read these as a series. I've got them. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a very nice uh, three part forms a picture of uh, Chairman Mao there. But yeah, please shout out your books for anyone who's listening or watching who'd be interested. Great. Well, it's basically the People's Trilogy. Uh, that's okay. The first one, uh, it's not in a chronological order. The first one looks at um, the famine. It's called Mao's Great Famine, and from 58 to 62, um, tens of millions of ordinary people were starved, worked, beaten to death. When China really became a, a sort of massive uh, camp, a massive people's commune, where people were told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And then the second book in the trilogy goes back in time and is entitled The Tragedy of Liberation. It's really on 1949, the moment when the communists uh, come to power in the following years. And it's astonishing that if you walk into any library, say the Harvard Bookshop, you will find plenty of books on 1917 when Lenin takes power Mm -hmm. in Russia. But there's hardly a thing on 1949 when Mao takes power in China. And it's such a crucial moment. So that's the second book in the trilogy, um, probably the one I would recommend most. And then there is a book on the Cultural Revolution, uh, which has been described so often as a period of, of chaos. But it's much more than that. Chaos is just a lazy way of describing four very distinct periods that run through the Cultural Revolution. Um, we tend to think of it as one thing, but it's really Mao using the people to purge the party from 66 to 68. Then he uses the army to purge the people, including sending many of them to the countryside, millions of them. And then in the end, of course, he purges uh, the army. Uh, that's from 71 onwards. And then the last one is China after Mao, the, the last 40 years, a much b- bigger chunk of history. Um, those are the four books. And then there is, of course, in between a book on dictators, how to be a dictator, on eight dictators, which I think everyone here in Hong Kong understood to be really about Xi Jinping, although a few readers picked that up elsewhere. That's really the book about Xi Jinping, although his name is barely mentioned. Oh, I, I keep saying last question, but here's the actual last question. Of the eight dictators, I don't want to say the word favorite because that has a moral implication to it. Aside, let's which, which put aside, you know, Hitler and Mussolini, Hitler and Mussolini, they're, they're, they're obvious. Who, are, who is the most interesting dictator a listener has not heard about um, who you profiled? Oh, I, I, if, if, if I would recommend um, one of them, it would be Duvalier, François Duvalier. I, I, I guess I that in my head, I, was, I, I, I knew that was who you were going to pick. That's great. <laughs> He's just astonishing. He's what I call a dictator's dictator. He pretty much runs everything himself. He's just sitting there at his desk from the uh, from his uh, presidential palace with a gun on the table, and it's all about pretty much pitting people against each other, making sure that you shoot not just your enemies but also your friends in error, making sure all of them tremble at what at what you do, and then he uses, of course voodoo, which is a very popular religion, to um, present himself as someone who is in touch with the other world, who's got extraordinary powers. It's all about fear, and he does it really, really well. It's a fascinating character. Yeah, it kind of it kind of comes through in the sense that there are there are obviously within the mythos, like mythical aspects to like Hitler or Mussolini, the way they portray themselves, but Papa Doc makes it very explicit. He, that's the point about dictator's dictator. He takes it to its own logical conclusion 
um, of course. Well, this has been, seriously, I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've really, really enjoyed your book. So I cannot recommend them enough. Thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. Okay. Thank you for having me.